Yeah. All right, it's, uh, as I like to say, it's about to be a historic event. You ready to roll? Okay. Hey, everybody. Good evening and welcome to the first in what I expect will be a vibrant and ongoing collaboration. Um, it's my pleasure and honor as the executive director of 1455 to partner with the amazing Peter Bulla Foundation, which is located in Winchester, Virginia. Um, we are going to be presenting programming together um, as part of an opportunity to feature, feature uh, the residents that come and stay there. There's a lot more information I'd like to say, and I can put, uh, we always record these events and I'll put it on the 1455 site. We can share a lot of information about what the foundation does, but uh, in brief, the Peter Bulla Foundation believes in supporting emerging artists and the arts through an interdisciplinary artist residency and through sharing the collection of the good doctor. Um, post COVID, the foundation will be planning to host events and gallery showcases throughout the year. And also throughout the year, they provide time and space for residents from different art forms to come and stay. That is how I came to meet tonight's special guest. Um, and we are hoping that we're, we have the opportunity going forward to do events like this, both virtually and in person uh, at the beautiful garden uh, at the foundation in Winchester, Virginia. And for those of you who are checking this event out for the first time, uh, 1455 in brief is a nonprofit dedicated to celebrating storytelling uh, and everyone who tells stories, primarily through writing, but also through all sorts of other art forms. And you can find out a ton more about us and what we do at 1455litarts.org. Um, I'm letting people in uh, through the, from the waiting room, some special guests. We ask you to um, turn off your cameras so you don't appear on the screen until it's Q&A time. We appreciate that. So without further ado, the reason that we are here tonight, the reason I've been excited and looking forward to this for quite some time we have the writer extraordinaire, Elle Renee here. I'm going to introduce her and then we'll bring her on and uh, we'll talk to her. But this is the abbreviated bio. I will put the full bio in the write-up after, but we'd be here all night if I read the whole thing. So I'm just gonna read the highlights. Elle is a poet and nonfiction writer from Columbus, Ohio. She holds an MFA in poetry from Indiana University where she also served as nonfiction editor of Indiana Review and Associate Director of Indiana University's Writers Conference. She has an MS in Journalism from Columbia University where she was Joseph Pulitzer II and Edith Moore Fellow. Her work nominated for Best New Poets and a Pushcart Prize has been anthologized and published in a variety, that's with a capital V, variety of publications. As mentioned, she was recent resident at the Peter Bulla Foundation for the Arts in Winchester, Virginia. She believes in black joy, which she occasionally expresses on Instagram at L. Renee Poems. L, I met you a few weeks ago and we, we tried to not leave it all on the field in our conversation to save it for tonight, but it's wonderful to be back in your presence. I thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate um, all the work that you and Katie um, have done to organize this event and share it with um, the folks in your community. So I'm really, really grateful um, and just thrilled to um, be able to talk about Virginia and West Virginia with folks from Virginia and West Virginia. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think there, you know, there are really, there are two primary goals, as I see it this evening, to get to know you better as both a person and a writer, and uh, certainly not least to hear you read some of your work. And we, we've set up a very loose schedule so that we can do a bit of both. Um, I, I think it's appropriate to talk about how we met, which is a good, it's both a shout out and an opportunity for you to talk a little bit about your recent experience at the foundation. Um, Maybe just talk a little bit about how that came to be, um, what you were doing there, which will be a great segue into your current project. And we'll definitely do a, a semi deep dive into what you're working on and hear some of the um, work in progress. 
Awesome. Yeah, so I was in Winchester, Virginia as actually the first uh, writing resident at the Peter, Peter Bullock Foundation. So that was really lovely. Um, it was the first time uh, that the foundation actually had uh, residents who had applied. Uh, so that was amazing. Um, it's just a really tremendous place in that there's a historic home where uh, I shared with another resident. There's a beautiful garden as well in the middle of the property. And then there's a second kind of structure where we each have our own studio. Um, so it's kind of like three particular, three different spaces that you have to kind of go between, which is really lovely. Um, Winchester itself, I'd never been there before, very much a walkable downtown. Um, it was really kind of cool to see some of the businesses uh, that were new that have popped up alongside really historic structures. Um, and that is very much in alignment with my work um, in that, you know, history is all around us. Virginia is a very specific place where I feel like the history and the landscape interact very much with the present. Um, but being in that space, you could see, you know, the office where George Washington worked at um, alongside of like a new uh, beers and hamburger joint, you know, all within walking distance from one another. Um, and I think that makes it a very interesting place for someone like me who's very much interested in time, who's interested in history who's interested in the ways in which um, Black folk have been um, erased from the archive um, and from present day history and the ways in which we appear. Um, and so I was just really, um, really excited to be there. Also to go to the Virginia farmer's market and have some local produce and food because I also write a lot about the land and landscape and nourishment. Um, so there are a lot of like overlaps there. Um, and I think one of the biggest kind of boons for me to apply as a writer in residence was also that Dr. Bullog uh, has a tremendous art collection. Um, and a lot of my work is dealing with the visual image, whether that be in documents, whether that be um, black and white old photographs. And he supported emerging artists of various different kinds. So I was really interested to see what does an emerging art collection look like from, a, from an early supporter. So I got to view some of that work and he was a tremendous lover of poetry and he had a great library. Um, and so one of the things that I also did while I was there was check out some of his books. Um, part of what, and I know we'll get into this a little bit, um, that I write about is uh, the fact that my family migrated from Southwest Virginia from tobacco fields to uh, Southwest West Virginia in the coal mines. And I noticed that in his, his collection in that he was um, uh, the head of path pathology um, at the special surgery um, hospital in Manhattan. And he focused on osteoarthritis, but he had these really old books that talked about diseases of workers. Mm -hmm. And I ended up like actually taking photographs of this like 500 page book that was um, translated from the Latin in 1713 and 1940, talking about the diseases of different workers. And those included tobacco workers and wet nurses and midwives and farmers. Um, and then he had this other uh, book that was really tremendous to me, and that was the history of miners and diseases. And so I was able to look at um, how folks in the 1940s was talking about coal mining going all the way back um, to the Neolithic age. Um, so that was a tremendous resource to be able to not just think about my own family and their own and my family and neighbors and extended families lives, but think about coal miners who existed well before um, my family migrated to West Virginia. Uh, so that was really tremendous for me to see the ways in which um, some of these diseases and some of these issues have very much been a part of the medical community for hundreds of years. And yet my grandfather was dealing with some of the same problems that people knew about and, and did nothing about. So that was something that I'm often thinking about these kind of repeated lessons that maybe we should have learned from 
that we continue to not learn from in the name of capitalism and comfort. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, what a, what a wonderful uh, plug for the foundation. And I think that 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 kind of fortuitous discovery is exactly what their mission is, right? The, the notion of, of course, we want to provide writers time and space to create and, and establish and reconnect with community, but also the opportunity to, to really take some time uh, and explore those archives. I've had the good fortune of seeing that library. And it's really, as, as a writer, it's incredibly humbling to hold like history that's centuries old. And it's a reminder of what connects us. And of course, the landscape in Virginia is like a living history lesson, the good, the bad, and the ugly, which is, I think, a good enough segue. I want to, I, first, I want to, I want to talk about the title of your project, because the title alone is so perfect and arresting. It gives me goosebumps just seeing it on the page. And the dust still sings Black Appalachian Inheritances. Um, and you, you, you've, ex I want to give you the chance to talk about it. I could read from some of what you've written about it, but I, I would prefer to hear you talk about it. But maybe just explain, you've done a little bit already, you've teased us, but the origins, um, how this evolved. And I think in particular, um, just from the bio I read, it's clear you do have a background in, in journalism and nonfiction. You're obviously a celebrated poet. And I think as we can get into a little bit, this project offers you the opportunity to really explore kind of a confluence of these different skill sets and, and disciplines. But talk a little bit about what you're doing and how it came together. Oh, sure. Um, I think if I were to start talking about it, it would really begin in childhood. Um, so my maternal grandparents died when I was three and four years old. And so a lot of the ways in which I accessed my family history was through story, was through narratives, was through the traditions that my family kept. Um, and so because I was kind of cut off from that actual like human who could tell me their story about the past, I just had just this tremendous um, imagination when I was growing up about what that looked like and what, you know, what was this place where they lived, um, particularly before I knew about my family's connection to Virginia, uh, which I can tell you a little bit more about in a minute. Um, I just knew that my grandfather was a coal miner for 43 years in, in McDowell County, West Virginia. And, you know, my family kept a lot of the traditions from that place. And I was a voracious reader growing up and I never saw those kinds of stories reflected in any of the texts that I read. I never heard about black and brown people who lived in the hills in West Virginia. Um, I think there's a very particular image that a lot of people have of what rural encompasses and who rural areas encompass. And I felt like my family, my family stories that I grew up hearing um, just weren't reflected. And so part of the kind of joy of this project really began when I was really young, just listening to my family tell stories, funny stories, terrifying stories. Um, and that just kind of stayed in my, my heart and my mind. Um, I think uh, the project really kicked off for me, um, which this is really tremendous to think about, uh, 15 years ago when I was a student at Roanoke College, shout out to Roanoke College, all the Roanoke folks streaming, um, which is in also um, Southern Virginia. And um, I didn't know actually until I was going to go to Roanoke College that my family had originally started, so to speak, in the US in Southwest Virginia. So when I realized that revelation, um, there's a program at Roanoke called the Summer Scholars Program that I was um, accepted into where they paid me to be able to stay on campus for the summer, my senior year and do research. Um, and I proposed this project that had this whole proposal about looking to find out who my family wa uh, were, my ancestors, where they lived, um, and trying to think about um, what the element of Sankofa, which means to go back and to get it, what that looked like 
in comparison with um, Black literature and my family story. So that was like an ambitious project when I was a senior in college. And that experience was transformative and it just really stayed with me. Um, and so over the course of the last years, every time I would come home to visit, we would have different family gatherings, which would be the occasion for storytelling, where I could ask more questions. And my mother, to, to her real credit, um, is a keeper of all of this ephemera. So I, I was able to touch my grandfather's coal miner's car that's still covered in coal dust from the 1930s. I was able to look at old photographs that he kept in an old um, fishing tackle box. You know, um, all of these bits that were just kept over the years, um, letters that um, he had from the 1970s and 80s correspondence for his black lung claim where he was denied several times. Um, old cards, funeral programs, just all of this material. Um, and I felt like I wanted to render these lives visible, that it was my kind of obligation and my duty as someone who could tell story um, and be able to use hopefully poetic craft to do it, um, to take all of these materials and synthesize them and do research and set my family's story in the context of what was going on um, in those places in the country at that time. So it was a huge, and it still is, you know, a huge um, task. Um, and there is no mastery over this. Um, every question just led to more questions. Um, and I think that's what good art is supposed to do, um, not necessarily give us prescriptive answers, but force us to reimagine and reconsider where we started from. And that's most definitely been my process thus far. So my project really, um, if I were to describe it, it documents and transmits the experiences of my maternal ancestors from the tobacco fields of Southwest Virginia to the coal mines of Southern West Virginia during the 19th and 20th centuries. I fuse both these kind of visual elements of ephemera that I've talked about, along with poems, along with artifacts, um, documents, as well as lyric prose to kind of stitch quilt I use the word quilting a lot, this tapestry um, that showcases the legacies of Black Appalachians. Um, and so I also situate myself as a speaker collecting all of this material and interrogate kind of the politics of memory, generational patterns that come up, these familial objects. And I'm asking myself, the speaker is asking herself, what have I inherited? from these family members who made these migrations with the hopes of attaining a better life? And then what of these inheritances are in service or disservice to my needs to be a free Black woman? Some of the things we inherit, right, um, are not useful for us going forward, um, may have been coping mechanisms to deal with traumas. And so what are the things I need to let go of so that I can be a free Black woman in the US today? So I have kind of a lot of themes around identity and womanhood, lineage, the body, trauma, joy, landscape, migration. All of these things are factors um, in, my, um, in my work overall. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I hope that answers your question. I mean, it, it, it answers it and, it and it begets dozens of other questions, which, you know, I would love to go down some rabbit holes, but I think what you're talking about is such an elemental purpose of storytelling, right? From a, from a creative perspective, it's this notion of wanting to somehow encompass and embody these stories that haven't been told. But I think you, you, there's a certain urgency, a kind of a, a cultural urgency to the work you're doing because you're also reclaiming, you know, we talked about Virginia and a very complicated history and present. I mean, let's face it, that, that that's not uh, ancient history, but reclaiming stories that weren't told, um, but taking it through a very personal lens. So I think there's an extra kind of responsibility and an extra pressure on the artist uh, in your case. Uh, this is not a research paper, you know, done through uh, the lens of kind of a safety of objectivity. This couldn't be more personal to you. So 
I salute you for really jumping into something like this, but also I think I'd love to hear more about when or how you recognized that a straightforward narrative or, or just poetry were not going to be sufficient. And I feel like that makes this a very contemporary project because I, I feel like 20, 25 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, it wouldn't have, there, there would have been so much pushback. Like you can't combine genres like that. Now I think we're in an area, you know, in our, in our evolution artistically where it's like, of course you can, you have to, you know, there's, you have to do what you're doing. Yeah, that's such a great question. Thank you for answering that question. I will say um, my peers and mentors really helped bolster my confidence that that was possible, that the way in which I wanted to go about the project was possible. Um, I had a tremendous committee chaired by the amazing Ross Gay, who's here tonight. Love you, love you, love you. Um, and Adrian Matika and Stacey Lynn Brown um, and Rachel Eliza Griffiths, who's uh, both a poet and writer and visual artist who helped me think about some of the visual elements of the project. Um, and so I had really great support. and my tremendous community at IU's MFA program, who also were like excited when I talked about all of this random stuff I was thinking about kind of stitching together. So I think coming from a place of not approaching the project as this is gonna be the book, but this is the work that I want to do. This is the thing that I feel called to make and kind of worrying less about um, the initial fear, like who's going to publish this? Who's going to want something? Like this is like, ex this is going to be expensive. Like who's going to make this thing with photos and ephemera? Yeah. Um, and then I started to see, as you said, so many other writers who are interdisciplinary, who are publishing tremendous books. Um, I list among many, we can talk about kind of books of consequence for me, um, documents by Jan, Jan Henry Gray, which has beautiful um, documents up in by Claire Muse, Knox by Ann Carson, Neckbone by Avery R. Young. Um, I could go on and on and on, Krista Franklin, um, just these, these writers who were incorporating documents, photos, paintings, thinking about space on the page. Um, and that really helped me and gave me permission that, that this was possible, that I could find a home for this work. Um, and I think the other reason why I didn't feel like this could be, this project could be kind of a straight narrative is because, you know, the one thing you always learn when you're interviewing folks is that there are multiple sides to every story. It depends what perspective, what a person's motivations are, um, what people withhold for their own, for the needs to protect themselves or maybe some of the decisions that they made. So there's no kind of singular truth. There are different, different perspectives on an event or an occurrence. Um, and so it was important for me to have like the speaker who's grappling with her own um, feelings about family and loss um, in that, you know, kind of being cut off from grandparents, the speaker also has an absent father. So a whole other side of the family that she has no connection to. So grappling with that um, through all of these different modes, um, the oral histories too, um, were just so important. I, I couldn't see telling it, telling it the way it needed to be told in a singular form because that, that experience of lineage and inheritance that doesn't happen right through one mode. Some people inherit land. Some people inherit tangible things like jewelry. Some people inherit recipes, right? Other people can look in the mirror and see their mother in their, on their face, right? Um, some people also inherit, you know, behaviors, right? Sometimes people inherit their parents' anxieties or worries or destructive patterns. So I wanted to be able to show how, um, the many different ways in which we can inherit a thing in my work. Yeah, well, 
that tees up my, my, my first request, which is what better time and what better way to really get into the work than to hear some of it. Would you be willing to give us a taste of, of, of some of the work in progress? Sure. Um, I'm going to read two poems that are kind of um, more on the shorter side. I tend to write long, so I'm going to leave the long ones for later. Okay. Um, so this first poem is actually forthcoming in Waterstone Review, um, and it kind of gets at what we were talking about, the ways in which there are many different versions of a truth in a family. Um, and this poem is entitled, Why Family is a Fraught Term. Because an aunt or uncle is really a blood cousin. Because a blood cousin is really a secret aunt. Because secrets weigh more than blood. Because blood wasn't the only thing made us family. Because family is six children sharing a room. Because a room is six children sharing three beds. Because beds are mattresses laid on brick blocks because brick blocks can always be scavenged, because scavengers always look for what they can save, because saviors are rarely fathers, because blood fathers are rarely home, because home is a place my grandmother built, because home is a place my grandfather bought, because home is a yellowing Polaroid, because home is a headstone we don't visit no more. So in that poem, you hear this kind of unraveling of definitions, of titles, of known facts. Um, and I think that that's really important um, in any work, um, but most especially in my project is to like, I. I I think the speaker has a healthy um, skepticism about any one thing that that she's reading or hearing, right? She's trying to absorb all of the different elements um, to weave them together. So there's some desire to have a semblance of as close to a true thing, as complicated as truth can be, not oversimplified with titles and um, certainty. So um, that's that poem. This next poem I'll read um, was published in Ten House Online. Um, and this poem I wrote as I was um, absorbing some elements of a genealogical trip. I went to some old courthouses in Virginia with my old college professor, shout out to Dr. Virginia Stewart. Um, and uh, we saw a lot of interesting things on that trip. Um, and one thing I found was some information on my great great grandmother, but it was presented. Um, you'll see in the poem, the librarian was a little bit dubious about the information that I found. Um, and so that was the kind of initial inspiration for the poem. But then I was at a wonderful writers conference, the Minnesota Northwoods Writers Conference one summer where there were tons and tons of mayflies. And they, I learned that mayflies only lived a day. So, um, you know, they, they were born, they procreated, they died, um, and their bodies were everywhere. And those poems kind of merged thinking about um, how present death is um, and how present life is at the same time. Um, so yeah, so that's what you need to know about this poem. It's called Genealogical Trip to Pulaski, Virginia. The mayfly swarm undulates like the perfect hip roll modeled bodies plow brown bodies midair. Wings fade as fine gossamer and June sun buoyed by a buzz too quick to be caught by my eye, which doesn't want to bear the witnessing. How nature persists in getting on with it publicly, life, sex, death in the span of a day. I turn away overcome by shame. I look through my Ford's cracked glass at white mile markers blurring a black highway. Why does our making always begin 
in denial. When I find my great-great-grandmother, Frances Houndshell and the census records, branded mulatto and a mother at age nine, I do not wince. I practice numbness, focus only on getting back to the alpha mama who owned her own body, her own name, somewhere off the coast of Ghana or Nigeria, maybe, where her breath, not her sweat, was enough currency. In Virginia, it's common to see the dead. Mayflies skip across pavement like flat rocks tossed side-armed at a stream surface, then lodged in sidewalk cracks among orphan pebbles, sticks, and sprigs of grass. I'd rather look at uncountable rolls of tobacco leaves which leave me breathless, dizzy even. All those green ears flap like an elephant's hello, hang woody scents heavy through my car vents like next of kin hugs hugged only at family reunions. In death, female mayfly lips freeze into an O, as if reading a whistle, as if leaving evidence of no. After the males give chase, grab their tiny legs, drag them to the ground. After the mount, it happens like this whole lives purposed for labor and procreation. Night collects her bounty. By daybreak, bodies pile by the hundreds on windowsills and porch corners in the middle of a passage, pedestrian stroll between a jail and courthouse. The nice white genealogist at the local library tells me Francis's age must be wrong an error in reporting, but I know a nymph can be snatched from her skin, molt and molt until she becomes something new, gains wings if only for a brief view of the dust she will soon call home. Thank you for, wow, wow, I mean, I knew the poems that you were going to read would give us a, some insight into this project and what you're working on, but, but boy, does that encapsulate so much. Um, there's so many directions I'm, I feel obliged to take this in, but, but I, I wanna ask a, a very high level question because I think, you know, for me, speaking personally, Al, when, when you read really authentic work, um, that, that comes from, from a, a place of both urgency and, and love and care. It, it does seem like it's the right work from the right person at the right time. And just knowing what I know about you, it seems like you really are clearly, I mean, first of all, I wanna, I wanna celebrate your poetic voice, which is just so beautiful Aww. and so powerful. Um, and I don't, I, it's a compliment, but I mean, I'm just stating facts. So let's not even, I'm not even being nice. That's just, you just are crushing it. But your journalistic eye, you know, your grad student research eye, um, you are so clearly using these muscles that you've developed um, in the service of doing this heavy lifting because you've got the, the, the burden and the obligation, right? Like it's such a privilege to tell the story and bear witness for those that have come before and pay respect and, and reclaim the past. But there's also what so much pressure to get it right and to and to try to make sure you're what do you leave in, what do you leave out? Because you're the ultimate arbiter, right? Of these of of interpreting who told you what and what they didn't say probably meant more than what they did say. But maybe talk a little bit about how you're have have you're wearing a lot of different hats. Uh, and I think that makes the, the, the material much more urgent and beautiful, but gosh, it's a lot harder, I would imagine too. Yeah, um, it is. That's a really great question. Um, I think, you know, for that poem that I just read, um, one of the things that you find, particularly when you're doing genealogical research for of Black folk, um, is that there are lots of 
questions that you will just never know, right? I see this ancestor, if I look at three different census reports, there are three different ages that are wildly different, then I hold that up to the light of this researcher who tells me, oh, that one can't be right because this person couldn't have had a child this young. But then their oral history from my family that tells me this ancestor and her daughter were remembered like sisters rather than mother and daughter. And so, you know, and then there are later documents where there are questions about the age um, that also cause into question about where are you getting what information and from what document. And so I have to hold all of these things up to the light. And I think for me, when I think about truth, I don't think about truth in terms of fact, um, factual truth. I think about what is the truth of the heart? What, um, what's the, what's the, that's the thing that like, I feel like journalistic and nonfiction writing in certain styles, less creative styles, they, you, you don't always get that. Um, because there's an objective and there's a lens of objectivity, but I'm implicating myself in all of the ways the speaker um, is does have an agenda. The speaker does want to know certain information. The speaker does want to say, well, why am I like this? Well, how did I learn this? Well, who, who taught this person to teach me that thing, right? Um, and so it makes it more complicated, honestly. But research is a really important aspect of my work. It fuels me. I love, love learning new things. I've always been like that kid I used to get in trouble. My mom's actually sitting right across from me on the couch. Hi, mom. Um, I actually used to get in trouble because I would take a flashlight and at, at my bedtime, I would <laughs> be under the covers with a flashlight and a book um, and I was supposed to be asleep because I've always had this kind of curiosity to know things and, and learn new new things. And so that's how um, I've, I've been able to approach this work, um, even just different digressions of facts that kind of come into play. Like one of the things, um, less so that has to do with my project, but, but theme, thematically wise, I think in conversation, I talked to Katie about the fact that <clears throat> when I was in Winchester, I spent some time at the Hanley Regional Library. They have this tremendous archive room, the Stuart Bell Jr. archives room, and I was looking at some records there. Obviously, they're not genealogical, but they're regional. They help inform my sense of place about Virginia and time, um, particularly, like I said, because Winchester has such old, old um, like artifacts that are alive. And one of the things I've, I think about and I've been thinking about is the archive and what our relationship is, in, is to the archive, whose stories get to get, be told and whose stories are not told. And even um, in Winchester, which is a lovely place, um, but you know there are a lot of markers on places that are historic that let you know that <laughs> this is you know, the Stonewall Jackson's headquarter museum. This is George Washington's office museum. And it's announced. Um, and I was really, um, I talked with Katie about this, really taken by learning about this house there on South Loudon Street um, that used to chain and, and house enslaved people. And there's no marker. That house exists. And there, there's letters detailing all of this information. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I found a letter that detailed that there is this basement with rings that were used in the floor to restrain slaves. Yeah. And there's no marker for that. There's no marker for those lives. And so how do we, if we're gonna tell a story or tell a thing, right? If, if people are part of the fabric of a place, that's all people. Um, and so what does that mean? What, 
what history, what peoples do we remember? What monuments do we uphold? And what are the people and places and monuments that have not been erected that people should know? And so that those kinds of things are always in my mind, thinking about how to shine a light, whether it's in, you know, prose or poems of people whose lives mattered. And I feel um, such an urgency to tell those stories and to do them justice to the poetic truth of the thing. Um, and not just, um, you know, what we find in paper, because I've learned through assembling all of these records that sometimes the paper doesn't get it right. Um, and that is a tremendous challenge and, I, it, and it requires me to make lots of decisions. And I just have to ask myself at the end of the day, can I look myself in the mirror and be okay with the decision that I've made as an artist? What is motivating the choice that I'm making? And I wrestle with that a lot. Um, and so that's why I send out my work like after I'm like, it, it sits a while with me <laughs> before I usually submit anything because yeah. I think it's a great responsibility um, to put work in the world that I can feel proud of, that my family um, may not always like, but hopefully will still feel proud of at the end of the day. Sure. Sure. You, you unpacked a lot there, uh, but I, I think one thing that, that certainly gives me hope as someone that celebrates story is, you know, we hear a lot in the media, you know, about there's, there's a lot of noise right now. Uh, and I don't even really need to explain what I mean by that, but just there's a lot of, of, of purposeful and cynical noise about who owns stories and, and, and American history in particular. What gives me uh, optimism is that I think societally on balance, we are at long last in a position where we can receive these stories and other voices that have traditionally been either outright silenced or you know pushed to the side. There's been the, you know, the history of record and there's a reckoning occurring that's way overdue, uh, but I think is ultimately gonna be very cathartic and very healthy. I don't pretend that it's easy uh, or painless, but your, your project, I think, is a microcosm of why this is so urgent and important. Because you're telling a very personal story. It couldn't be more personal. But it's also everything you just talked about is why this will resonate. Because your family's history is connected to so many other like uh, families and their histories, which is telling the story of America that hasn't been told. So I feel like this is, this is an act of poetry, it's an act of, of beauty, it's an act of witness, but it's also an act of reclaiming and, and giving voice to a story that people that, that don't want to hear this history need to hear it the most. Yeah, and there's also room still for a lot of joy. Um, I, I have um, a couple of other poems I've, I've pulled out. Um, that are about like celebration, that are about tradition, that are about very much my family is a, a foodie family. And so a lot of our gatherings are based on food and recipes and old, um, I have a poem, I'm, I don't think I have it here for today, but I have a poem that I wrote about a tradition where my, in my family, um, sorry to the patriarchy, but um, there is this kind of belief that on the first day of each year, a man has to walk through your door to bring you good luck. And so my grandfather used to do this for his whole life. And then he passed away. And my uncle, who's like the oldest surviving male family member, continued that tradition to, and to this day. And he's well in his 80s. And he wakes up three in the morning and goes by all the sisters' houses on January 1st every day to walk through their door. And we all have little small meals we make for him. But he comes to my house last because my mom makes him all his favorite things. And he sits and tells me stories, right? Tells us stories. And that's a tradition that's around food and, and place and time. And so those kinds of things are also as equally important as the document things, right? Those kinds of gatherings where 
um, the occasional poem, which I love, that documents a moment or something celebratory um, is really, really also important to my work. Um, so maybe that's a good way to segue <laughs> into another poem. Definitely. Um, okay, so I have, I'm gonna, I'm trying to decide between these. Okay, I'm gonna read this one first um, for my beloved Noah Davis, uh, my fisherman. Um, this poem is, uh, you'll hear what it's about in the title. The only thing you should know for this one is that I reference a song by Luther Vandross called Bad Boy Having a Party. And if you don't know the song, you need to Google it or right after this, it will get you up, ready to dance with your beloveds. Um, and I also reference a card game um, called Bidwiz that's similar to Spades um, that my family plays. So this poem came out in the Appalachian Review. It's called Fish Fry. Fish Fry, everything delicious is served on Friday. Jesus should get a do-over for the Last Supper since he missed out on the miracle that is wonder bread made paste by purchase cornmeal skin sweat and Crisco clinging like faith to a mouse roof even as the tongue tries to negotiate release swap freedom for teeth we know what delayed tastes like we have waited for a check that affords us this feast of fish golden crisp and the glow of black joy with Luther Vandross praising us for being bad on Aunt Mary's 45 spinner, who would call this dinner? Stovetops bubble with pots of kale and collards made sides only by smoked ham hock oozing, salty fat, their doneness determined by Mama Joyce who dips her too blessed to be stressed mug in the pot liquor and sips slowly, purses her lush lips and declares it got more melting to do. Ain't that true for all of us? She snorts every time Lil Russell comes by to kiss her highest cheekbone. His jeans drifting toward hell like he forgot his real tribe. Never mind, no matter, we made it here together, the old timers will say. Though they suck their teeth at the sight of his draws, at the sight of a renigger at their bidwiz table, at the scent of Dee Dee's too sweet macaroni and cheese. We all fall short of perfection like memory, but Uncle Harold brings us back to where we started. Yellow perch biting their ashen end of a line in Lake Erie's Ohio waters. The place granddaddy wearing his old mining boots taught generations the patients needed to stay fed. Uncle Harold will never bring the tartar sauce cousin Kathy out east developed a taste for. He will fling back his James Brown slick bouffant crown and howl the sound of hunting hounds choking on coal dust. Remind her she's still a West Virginia holler girl. Remind me, travels ain't useful without this knowing. So that's fish fry. We all love a good fish fry. So if I can just say real quick, uh, fanboy, that was the first poem I read of yours and I adore it. And so what a gift for me personally to be able to hear you read it. Thank you. Um, uh, bless, bless. I'm delectable, so delectable. <laughs> Just, uh, it's everything. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read this other one, this new one. Um, it's nowhere. So this is hot off the presses of, of my desk. Um, but we talked a little bit about um, about how I decide to approach these things. And this poem was a new one for me um, because it's written in persona, which I don't often write in. I wasn't really comfortable writing in the voice of someone um, real or imagined. I, I always had trouble getting there and committing to it. Um, but my aunt told me this story about trying to burn her saddle shoes um, that she hated on an old coal stove that she had to wear to school all the time. And I tried to write that as her telling me the story the net, as, the, as the speaker, and it just didn't work. I had to write it in a different voice and it came alive. And so I write this poem from the perspective of her sister watching her attempt to burn these shoes and the terrible irony at the end of the poem, which you'll hear is that she burned herself and not the shoes. So, and this one is also 
using the kind of language that I would hear my family kind of speak in, there's this kind of twinning where, you know, to the public and to the broader world, you know, we use very correct English, but together things get, you know, butchered a little bit and people start to revert back to their speech in West Virginia and um, in Virginia. And so I really wrestled with whether or not to do that, but it felt like a true thing. So this piece is called Shoes, Bluefield, West Virginia, 1961. First time I watched my sister set a fire, she's 12 and I was eight. Mama and daddy leave for a card party, which mean Rosie and Billy flee for they secret flames, which mean the middle kids. Harold and Velma and Lois ain't too far behind them spying. Foot knowledge can learn you faster than books. Dirt and rock and branch and bush be as kindred as kin. Then the house empty of all our beloveds and it's just my sister and me. My sister and her school saddle shoes, which she did not love. They ain't had no scuffs, but brown specks caked them like dirty powdered sugar. Titten white leather, pea yellow lie could never make clean. My sister say her shoes too ugly to be redeemed. She say redeemed like it cost five whole dollars. Slow and careful like mama putting milk and butter and bacon and bread on account at the company store. Hoping daddy tagged enough coal cars, hauling loads large enough to break even. Being that she had reached for that word and found she could afford it. My sister tried to free herself from three years of ugly duckling living, three years of wearing the same shoes to school since our folks would not replace what they could repair. She seized what she sized up as her only chance to waste leftovers. First, I thought she was kindling the stove's coal and wood chips to warm up pintos from last night's supper. But when heat hovered, hot as a pissed spirit, a horseshoe doorway couldn't keep away. When a hankering for new shoes flickered and her peepers like a just struck match. By the time I noticed her knowing strike, aha, lightning fast. It was too late to redeem her. The stink of melting skin and rubber blew through our kitchen. A groan slid slow and careful, like it was calculating a bill that ain't add up. Burner plate lid lifted, lard slathered leather. The fiery tongue tested and still clutched in her blistered fingertips. My sister's disbelieving. Uh. Your words are so alive and so full of life. Um, it's it's so appropriate for the, the the fact that you are you know giving voice to beautiful people who are no longer with us. Um, you're, you're you're doing that history so much justice and and in such a beautiful way. I just want to step out of the way and and clap. So again, thank you for 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 sharing that work. Um, I want to be cognizant of of time, which is not infinite. But I know Katie uh, from the foundation is here. I certainly want to uh, make sure she has an opportunity to ask a question and uh, show herself. And if we've got time for comments or questions from others, um, as always, I'm I'd be more than happy to make myself scarce and and see the spotlight a little bit. Well, thank you, Sean. And obviously, thank you, Elle. This has been incredible just to listen to. And I feel like I have all these images now that, you know, you've drawn such pictures in my mind. And I now I'm also thinking about fish fry. I'm not going to lie. Um, so uh, one of the things I love that we spoke about when you came to visit um, was about kind of these things that your family had collected, these pieces that were um, a part of who you are and that will be a part of um, this book and everything. I was wondering, um, is there, as you think about all of them, is there any piece 
um, that sticks out to you as like something that's particularly meaningful, something that's really inspired you, um, any artifact that really uh, holds that place for you? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. That's a great question. Um, there are so many things. Um, like I said, I have um, this artifact that is my the card that my grandfather used to carry with him into the mines. Um, I have, he has, let's see, um, I don't know. I was trying to see if I had, if I, if it was something that I could pull up. Um, I have also a picture, which I do want to share. Let's see if I can do a screen share really quickly. Uh, yeah. Can y'all see that? Yes. Okay. So this is um, a picture that I found in the National Archives um, that, is stayed with me. It's a picture of the coal camp where my family um, lived, Gillum Coal Camp in Gillum, West Virginia. And um, I just happened to be kind of jotting, I don't know, just typing things into the search field, honestly, uh, for coal camps in the National Archives. And I was shocked to find a whole uh, collection on the coal camp where my family lived um, in the 30s and 40s. And even more so shocked um, that in the center of the picture, the woman who kind of has her, her fist kind of bald and is looking directly in the camera is actually my aunt. Um, and this image, uh, I have a long, long poem about it. Um, that I'm so honored uh, was a finalist for the Rattle Poetry Prize uh, was announced last week. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like the cold camp where my family lived is in the title. Um, and this image was something that really stayed with me um, by Russell Lee. And so um, that's also something that is in the book that's been really lovely um, to, to find. I have um, in my family, the women in my family would cut their hair based on the moon cycle. And um, my mother has kept an old family Bible that has like whole locks of hair in it, um, which is really tremendous to see. So I have things like that. Um, have such an array of things and I'm trying to figure out like my grandmother's old hair pressing combs like how to preserve and keep them um, and make them honestly looking at what a Dr. Bullock did at the foundation with how he curated uh, the room was really helpful for me to think about um, space and form and how to present things that are uh, meaningful to you um, whether or not they're, you know, considered like art, art pieces that you bought from someone. So I've been thinking about how, how to keep those and showcase those, but, but yeah, th they're all very dear. I, I'll be honest, the one thing that stuck in my mind was I was thinking about that, the Bible that you had mentioned with all the locks of hair and just how how impactful that is to see that. So, you know, we've talked a little, we've talked a little, we talked a lot about your project. I think the people watching and myself foremost among them are curious, um, not to put any pressure on you, but what, where, where are we in terms of completion? Are we in the early stages, the middle or closer to the end? Like what, what, where are you at? Where are we going? Did we get there yet? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm definitely not in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I have, you know, a manuscript that I put together in part, um, as, as you mentioned, I got my MFA at Indiana University in Bloomington, shout out to my university. Um, and so I turned in like a hundred or so pages of work. Uh, but I think a lot of people say, you know, your, your, your MFA thesis, you should kind of shelve it for a while and and then go back to it with fresh eyes I think that's true um I think also for me I'm still wanting to do more research um I was lucky enough to receive a grant from the Barbara Deming Foundation um which will allow me to travel to parts of Virginia and West Virginia over the, the next year 
um, and stay on the ground for a while there um, in the communities, the small hollers where my family lived. Um, and I just feel like being there again for the first time in a long time will yield some more and some new work. So I want to allow time and space for that. Um, I'm a slow writer. I'm not a writer who writes every day. I think that's also important for young people to, and all people to really know that um, I used to feel like a lot of imposter syndrome because I didn't write every day. Um, but everyone has a different process. And I, I, I realized that was not my own. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just going to be patient with the work and it will let me know when it's ready. Um, and yeah, and, and we'll see when that is. I, I feel like I'm definitely like probably going to be working on this project for the next year for sure. Um, but we'll see what happens after that. I mean, you know, to, to go with the fish fry metaphor, there seems like there's a lot of meat on this bone. I, I wouldn't be surprised, Al, if this yields a, a lot, a surplus of material that can be repurposed in, in poetry and, and perhaps multi-volumes. Um, it just seems like such an ambitious and important project that, um, yeah, I, I, I would imagine you're gonna have uh, stuff that maybe hits the cutting room floor that is still worthy of, of being used in some way. I mean, we need to read this work. And, and also to be also very crystal clear, that, that question came from a place of genuine, like selfish, when are we gonna be able to read this thing? So consider consider your uh, consider your consider me a fan that's already kind of hankering to see this. But great work needs time, so there is no intended pressure. It's more of a uh, a desire to start seeing more of this um, on the page. Yeah, I'm I'm being patient also with it because there's so many different layers. There's visuals, there's maps, there's photographs, there's documents. And so I know that's not going to be a project for every publisher, right? I know that everyone isn't going to take on that kind of um, project, especially for a first you know, a poet who is new in the world, you know, still emerging. I, I don't have five books behind me to, to show like, hey, this is this is going to be even close to a, maybe you'll break even on this. I, I can't say that. That would be a very big risk for a publisher to take. Um, but I believe and I have the faith that whoever is excited about the project um, will be a great collaborator and it will show up in the world in the way that I dream and I hope and I imagine. Um, and so I'm not going to put out anything that isn't like, that doesn't honor what I want it to be just to put something out. It has to be right. Um, and so that may have to be um, in an, an unconventional way of publishing. And I'm okay with that. Absolutely. And listen, I think it's really, it, 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 I'm really grateful that you just said what you said, because it does seem like the more writers I talk to, there's several themes that resurface, but one of them is, um, you know, what separates, I'm not even going to say the pretenders from the contenders. I'm just going to say a, a theme that comes up over and over again is in a, in a, a form, you know, in an artistic endeavor that's fraught with rejection and setbacks and obscurity. If you're not working on something that's deeply personal and meaningful to you, A, how can you expect it to resonate with an audience? But B, what a waste of time. You know, if you're chasing trends or chasing kind of a, maybe a cynical take on what might hit at a certain time, more power to you. But I think the work that endures uh, is coming from an honest place of urgency, but also what a waste of life. If uh, the, the kind of, those of us that, that write know a lot of work goes into it. So if that work is not fulfilling the, uh, the individual that's doing it, it just seems like why bother? So um, I think you've got all the momentum in terms of coming from a place of authentic, authenticity and urgency. Um, it'll find its audience and it'll certainly find a publisher. I, I have no doubt about that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's just one, it's just one fan's opinion, but 
from my humble mouth to the publishing God's ears. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that. So listen, the, the best compliment I can give you, aside from the fact that I adore you and adore your work, is that time always flies when you're, you know, having good conversation, but time really flew tonight. I've got two humble requests. One, that we continue this conversation because my bandwidth is available. So at your discretion, I think we could easily fill another hour, uh, you know, in Q4 of this year with more reading and more conversation and, and discussion of where your travels are leading you. That's an open invitation. Um, and maybe you can leave us with a poem um, if, if you care to. I think there's no better way to end than to hear the writer uh, leave us with some more of her words. Oh, bless. Thank you all so much. I really, really appreciate everyone coming out and the beloveds who are in the studio audience. It means so much that you all took time out of your night to come and to be here. I would definitely love to come back and talk with you a bit more, Sean and Katie, about any of the goings on of the goings on. Um, I, I got I got unanswered questions too. So <laughs> Well, I got maybe some more questions <laughs> not answered. Um, I think I will uh, I'll leave with this long poem and that'll probably just close us out. Y'all will probably be just ready to, to pass out with this one. Um, but um, this poem is the one that I wrote. Um, I was inspired to write after finding the photograph that I showed you all. Um, I've been thinking a lot about migration and movement. Um, and my collection has a series of Exodus poems um, that highlight the movement from Virginia to West Virginia, from West Virginia to Ohio. And then ultimately for me as a speaker, my return to Virginia um, for college. Uh, and this uh, was the first in that series of Exodus poems. And it begins with an epigraph. This is called Exodus Gillum Coal Camp, West Virginia, 1949. The epigraph is from a song by Aretha Franklin. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. Martha, don't you mourn. Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. On the day before Junior Mary graduated high school, she told her mother Mary she wanted to serve and protect, not in a maid's or nanny's uniform, but in army greens. At 17, she wanted to witness something other than coal and dirt and mountains and trees, something as infinite as water surrounding them islands she had seen in her mama's lifetime magazines. God's green earth, not besmirched by dark dust, dark rocks awakened from millennia of rest by explosives. The ocean's cerulean gloss sparkled like a sequin. Junior dress, Junior Mary sought to slink in. She imagined the water's cool kiss pecking her skin. How free it must be to float and not feel your own heavy labor. A body beyond debt, a mind without worry. She imagined the security of military wages that didn't nickel and dime you like coal bosses did. A fee for electricity, a fee for fuel coal, a fee for doctor's visits, a fee for blacksmiths to maintain the sharpness of metal picks, a fee for oil to put in a miner's lamp deductions subtracted from every payday, leaving you in the red or with meager balances. She did the math, gave her mama enlistment papers to sign. Big Mary did not weep. The family had had enough domestic work. The military wasn't no different. You still be cleaning up some white folks' messes, Big Mary had said. The army wasn't no place for a black woman. After all, Truman had just let women in last year. 
How a black woman gonna protect a country that ain't never cared about her years of service, the many generations of black women who worked without pay until they were dishonorably discharged into soil. At least in these hills, everybody knew who the white devil was. The coal company's lust for money traded for breath just like them slave time body snatchers who smuggled cadavers, drenched them in whiskey for preservation to be used by medical schools. The black body always traded in a black market, always a price, the only thing named, attached to the toe. Round these hills, everyone came out black and poor after a day's work. You could call a mountain a mountain, a spade a spade. Your faith might convict you to say move, and you might could see some version of the Red Sea parting your troubles with a lucky lotto pick. You knew you could sit anywhere on the bus Mr. Dick Arnold drove from coal camp to coal camp that you could stand in the same line as white folks at the company store where y'all all bought the same milk jugs and coffee tins for the same price which would be deducted from weekly wages if put on credit or paid for by scrip all of which replenish that devil's coffers again at least in these hills you could holler when the fire broke out and trust somebody would hear your screams Watch neighbors dash for ladders past well bucket water from one man down a line to the next. Put out the threat with dozens of hands, dozens of mouths crying out to the God of Moses, the staff of their tongues parting flame from wood, smoke curling up nostrils like frankincense or some other burnt offering of praise for that half of roof that could be saved. At least on that night when the gas lamp wick licked Big Mary's cotton drapes and made ashes of the pale pink roses patterned upon them. Big Mary did not weep, for she knew the pride of an honest day and the sorrow in it too. Another day's journey when somebody ain't turn up dead was something to give thanks for. When a girl barely old enough to sign her own wedding papers ain't made a widow like Martha, staring off at the tipple, expecting to see her man there by the rail car, but jarred back to the present when she hears coal pinging the metal containers like rain, like the fat wet blanket that made dirt slick and muddy. A bad sign the girl had told her man, begged her man to stay home on what was his last day on earth. And like a man fixing to feed his family, he did not listen. And now he was in the earth, buried deep inside earth's muddy pocket, tucked away and maybe rocked in the rocks that swung low and carried him home in that old shiny chariot that did not drown in the Red Sea. At least in these hills, death had an address. And if you listened hard enough, looked for the signs and dreams, it rarely could put the sneak on you. But Junior Mary ain't want her mama's at least. She wanted the most. The brightest city lights that couldn't be snuffed out by a poor mouth exhaling what little air had been waiting in dim hallways of blackened lungs rattling like an old car engine that can't turn over, can't do nothing but whir and whine and grind and click the bad starter of it all the bad start for which there is no replacement part, just chains of title, chains of parents bought and sold, bought and resold, souls wore out by the wear and tear, their bodies counted as coins in accountants books and insured and policies you still can find online by typing words like slavery era insurance 
insurance registry, California, or Aetna, slave insurance, or Nautilus, mutual life insurance on slaves, or US life insurance on slaves, where you might discover another Martha, age 14, a house girl valued at $1,000, or Anne, age 15, valued at $1,000, or Amanda, age 15, valued at $1,000, or Henry, a blacksmith, age 19, valued at $1,200 on January 13th, 1860, when Charles Meyer, the slaveholder, bought himself some insurance on who he thought he owned for a term of two months. And the insurance agent, David Bishop, added a handwritten note that Aetna would not be liable for any consequences arriving from smallpox or exposure to the same arriving to any of the above mentioned slaves who have not been vaccinated should they be moved from Missouri to the South by steamboat during the policy's term because Black folks always get forced to migrate for white men's enterprises and rarely do people call those enterprises what they are blood banking, because a black person always loses their life from that exposure. The deadly accruals in arriving to any place without consequences, without a claim to your one and only life, your balance sheet constantly in the red, indebted to a system that hangs freedom like bait from a rod that spoils the child into thinking what they could be spared from on something as flimsy as freedom papers and a new address on something as flimsy as enlistment papers and a new address but i'm digressing now junior mary ain't know all that Still, perhaps her bones quaked with all her ancestors, bodies, the body's inheritance, all the molecules that give instruction, messages rising up on silken arm hairs like goose pimples, beloveds whispering as they do to flesh, telling her to let Pharaoh's coal go, to flee the dirt roads as black as the night sky as blue black as big mary's heart would be in the morning when she found a note left by the old coal stove mama i'm leaving on a bus with martha to ohio they got more opportunities up there and she got an aunt we can stay with don't be mad love you mary wept thank you uh. Wow. Wow. And you know, I just want to, I want to thank you for, for sharing your work, sharing yourself. Um, I started tonight with the meager understanding that you were, you were working on a project about your family's history. Midway through the conversation, I realized you were writing about American history and listening to that last poem, I realized you're writing about world history. You're writing about everything and it's so vital and important. Um, I couldn't be more delighted and humbled to share space. And I can't wait to hear you read more of your work. So consider this an open invite. Let's talk offline and do this again. Invite your beloveds, they are welcome. Uh, and, and, and we will continue this fish fry, this poetic fish fry for lack of a better cliche. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, yeah, so Katie, much, thank you. And, and again, the first of hopefully many uh, collaborations where what we want to do is what we did tonight, have a conversation, hear wonderful words and, uh, you know, create a little bit of a platform to to stop and, and learn and listen and, um, you know, be better for it. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Elle. Just incredible. Thank you. Yeah, I want to go. I want to go stay with these words for a while but like i said uh all, all i'll say in closing is thank you for everyone that showed up al thank you for being you um it's just it's such a pleasure and uh let's talk more and let's do this again please sounds good good night all all right happy travels happy writing and everyone be safe and be well we'll talk to you soon bless thank you good night <laughs>